anybody who's new to this event. We do this every month. It's called Voices of Westerly. We talk to two different people every month from the community, from the Westerly Stonington community. Um, this is inspired by, you'll see in the hallway there, there is a showcase of portraits done by the local photographer, artist Joshua Behan. That series is called uh, Faces of Westerly. This is the podcast version of that. So we do these interviews every month. Um, and if you go down that hallway and you scan the little codes with each picture down the hallway, you can hear some of these interviews that we've done in the past. And then you can also find these interviews on YouTube and our, our anywhere you get podcasts. It's called Voices of Westerly. So today, today... Our, our first guest today is actually one of our first ever interviews we did. Uh, we're kind of just redoing it because we didn't record it back then. When we opened this place, we had this portrait series up here as a um, as, as kind of our opening gallery exhibition. Um, and we invited a number of those people to come and have a talk with us. And one of those people was Keith Cowley. So I'll, I'll invite Keith up here to the stage right now. Thanks for having me, Tony. You're welcome. Yeah, if you want to get the mic pretty close to you, that's, uh, it might feel awkward, but it's it's good. It's good for the content. So Keith is the curator of the Living Sharks Museum here in Westerly, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, among many other things. Um, and like I said, Keith was one of our first ever guests for the Voices of Westerly iteration of the Faces of Westerly show. So welcome back to the stage. We're actually recording this time, so excited for that. Um, I want to start because I, I don't. I this, it was a few years ago that we had this conversation, um, so I don't fully remember everything that we talked about, which is good. Um, one of the questions I don't know the answer to off the top of my head that I always start every interview with is kind of your westerly origin story. Are you a westerly native? So, no, I'm actually not originally from Westerly. Okay, so tell us how you landed here and where you're from. All right, well, I am from Connecticut, so like everyone says, you can just throw a rock at Connecticut from here. Um, I did grow up in the Stonington area. I went to high school at Wheeler, and I did a lot of traveling after high school before I landed back in this area, and I think that's an important thing for a lot of folks here, uh, getting out <laughs> and and seeing the world a little bit and you know what you end up doing is coming back and and gaining a lot of respect for what is here the things that i already knew that were here uh were the natural resources that we have uh just living on the coast and having a plethora of uh parcels of land uh that are preserved that can be explored so we're we're very fortunate with what we have here and when i came back uh, it was just after the recession, uh, things were starting to look up in a very new and interesting way. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that, that coastal connection. I curated the two guests tonight to be a little thematically tied um, and talk a little bit, uh, a little about our coastal economy, a little bit about the ecology, about our Atlantic Ocean region here. Um, so to start things off, I want to talk about the Living Sharks Museum and what the Living Sharks Museum is. But before we get to what the Living Sharks Museum is, let's talk a little bit about your history in ecology and um, would you call it maritime? It's not maritime history. You'd call it, what do you, do you have a name for, for the type of history when you're talking about marine life and the history of marine life? Uh, yeah, just marine heritage or marine history works, and uh, more specifically, sharks these days. <laughs> so I want to know how you landed there um, and and kind of what the genesis is from your interests and your work and how that turned itself into what is now the Living Sharks Museum, and then talk about what the Living Sharks Museum is. Okay. Well... When you fall in love with something, it usually happens when you're really, really young. <laughs> and for me, uh, prehistoric creatures, dinosaurs, megalodon, all those things that boys crave. And uh, I now know so many uh, females crave too. Um, I'm so excited about how popular sharks have become and uh, prehistoric creatures. But 
you know, I, I grew up as an only child. Uh, I didn't really have friends, so I wasn't experiencing uh, other kids and, and uh, other folks just uh, enjoying the same things that I did. So I was a self-starter and a, uh, a very uh, tenacious one at that. And so I would read everything. Um, I had all the National Geographics. Uh, I would draw every creature I could. And that's really where the depth of interest came from. And it was definitely science born, but growing up, I realized that I wasn't going to end up on a science track, uh, at least by going to college. There's the money wasn't there. I didn't really have a lot of guidance at that time in figuring out, you know, how to do that. So I had to figure it out on my own, which, you know, eventually come to find is how I've done everything in life, which makes things interesting and also tumultuous at times. And I crossed that bridge into realizing how much I love sharks when I started hanging out with my grandfather, um, who was a commercial fisherman out of Westbrook, Connecticut. Um, and I was spending summers with him and I was probably 12 and 13, 14, those three years in particular were vital for me. So I would get to go out with him and we'd come back with 72 bluefish and, you know, and every now and then he'd pull a shark on, on deck and uh, that was really cool for me. And, you know, we'd bring it back, it would be dead. Um, you know, I, I didn't really think about that then. It was just cool to see a shark. And, you know, this was the same kid that would go on family vacation down to Cape Hatteras and buy that shark in the bottle because it seemed like a really cool thing to do. Uh they fast forward into a little later uh, in life when I, I started doing a lot of diving. I was mostly diving for artifacts, uh, diving for shark's teeth, actually, because that was the route I decided to really uh, go when it came to uh, better understanding sharks. It seemed like the only accessible route for me. Uh, so I, I traveled, I, I looked up every locale that I could, where I could either dive or hunt for prehistoric shark's teeth. I studied everything about the geology of those areas, every layer. I understood everything I could about how to find the best specimens. I ended up with an amazing collection, which is where I thought Living Sharks Museum was going to eventually be. I didn't really know that uh, eventually I was going to end up in the water with sharks. Uh, and... As I got into doing a little bit of diving with sharks, uh, I started to realize that uh, I had uh, this deep compassion for them. I already had that compassion for other animals. I've always been a naturalist, uh, a wild food forager, and been in the, in the woodlands all the time. But getting underwater and experiencing sharks like one-on-one -on -one changed everything for me. And usually when that happens, uh, I know I'm kind of taking this all over the place, but usually when that happens, you start to develop all these kind of crazy ideas about, oh my God, sharks are amazing. Uh, sharks are the only organism on earth. Uh, I need to save this animal. <laughs> <laughs> and you start identifying with uh, all kinds of extremist conservation groups and things, trying to figure out how to, you know, find a place within all of it so that there can be some meaning and, and, and a movement to get behind. And so thus began a project called Living Sharks Project. This predated Living Sharks Museum. So this is where the living sharks term came from. And the term living sharks actually just applies to sharks that live today, modern sharks versus prehistoric sharks, or uh, the sharks that have been gone for a very long time. And in my time studying and, and beginning advocacy campaigns, uh, some in, in clandestine ways, um, uh, I, I learned a lot about how uh, the different industries work and uh, affect shark populations around the world. And I realized that there were very few physical outlets to teach people about this. And education, I don't, I don't want to say it was missing across the board, but there, there were just not the kind of resources I would have loved to have come in contact with when I was a kid, when I was really excited about sharks and really needed the scientific facts and, and to understand what the actual answers are to the questions that I was just throwing darts at uh, in the wild conservation world. 
And so Living Sharks Museum evolved into, I'm sorry, Living Sharks Project evolved into Living Sharks Museum uh, that actually doesn't have any living sharks in it. <laughs> so, what, I mean, what, what is the Living Sharks Museum? What does it become? Uh, I know you have a, a pretty interesting collection of artifacts, and some of those artifacts I know also um, harken back to you know, some of the, the media and pop culture movies in particular around sharks and around the fascination with sharks, which I know, you know, the fascination with sharks likes to paint sharks as this, this great villain, this great force to be reckoned with this, this force of nature. Um, so how do you use those materials? You know, you have some original draw jaws props and, and posters and things like that. How do you use that and, and kind of that history in media to teach about the conservation arm of sharks and the misconceptions while also celebrating that media, which I know that you love. I do. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I love it uh, as a moviegoer uh, and a lover of creature films, uh, but also uh, as a lover of uh, just the art of marketing. Uh, so much of obviously all these things that I've just talked about that I've done over uh, throughout the years uh, did not give me a fancy paycheck. Um, I had to work really hard in order to be able to travel all these random different places. So I became a creative consultant and I was a good graphic designer and an artist. So I'm, I put that to use. So I helped a lot of small businesses and, and conservation organizations. And that was how I kind of paid my way to do all this stuff. Uh, and within that, I developed a, a strong understanding of the power of branding and uh, just marketing as a whole. And what I realized is that what most people know about sharks is actually just through different arms of marketing uh, and social media, obviously being one of the strongest now. Uh, but if you go back to 1975, you know, the, the most intimate experience most anyone had with a shark was in the movie theater watching Jaws. So I use Jaws as sort of the connection to get people talking in Living Sharks Museum. We've got all kinds of amazing uh, artifacts from the film uh, and the film's marketing, just because that does interest me so much. And that gets us talking. Now we talk about where Peter Benchley even got this idea. A lot of people don't realize Peter Benchley spent time out on Frank Mundus' boat, the Cricket 2, out in Montauk, fishing for sharks. Uh, initially not fishing for sharks. He really just wanted to understand the process. But I learned recently he was actually on his boat five separate trips. Uh, and he did do some fishing. So he had this idea about pitching a horror story about sharks pretty early on. <laughs> Uh, and it wasn't until 1974 uh, where he actually put it together in a chicken coop right in Stonington Borough uh, and wrote this story uh, that terrified millions of people around the world. But ultimately, he w just wanted to tell this adventure story about people building a camaraderie on a boat, going out and, and solving a problem. And this problem for them was the shark that just wouldn't leave. Because this is a podcast that's kind of about Westerly as well. Um, and, you know, Jaws takes place in the Cape and there's, there's a lot of history and a lot going on with, with sharks in the Cape even today. Um, for people who live in this region with our beaches, such a natural resource in our waters, what do you think people should know about, about sharks in this region, it, you know, off of our coast here in Westerly? Oh, of course. Uh, people have a tendency to ask me pretty commonly, you know, do I need to worry about sharks? course just having a shark museum in westerly starts you know <laughs> ringing the bell a little bit it's like maybe we have to think about sharks why are you here um honestly i'm here for so many weird reasons uh, i love this place but uh, initially it wasn't because i was focused on any shark activity in our immediate waters but as i got deeper into working with shark researchers and started researching sharks myself um, I had, I've had the pleasure of doing work with a group uh, from 333 Productions, uh, Joe and Lauren Ramiro, who do a lot of work for Discovery Channel, and I've been helping them a lot with their research, and what I've been coming to learn is that these changing water temperatures are making things very interesting for us, and you know, there is a timeline. We're going to start seeing some things that 
we haven't really seen before or haven't seen in a very long time. And we're seeing rebounds of species that we've been protecting. And people have the internet, they've got camera phones, we've got social media. So the word about these things is just spreading quickly. So I have this cool opportunity to use our own backyard as a way to kind of dial that in and say, well, this is really what the reality is. No, we don't have to worry about swimming at Westerly right now. <laughs> this isn't really a big issue, but Rhode Island waters are teeming with lots of different species of sharks that people don't even realize. Like we're known for our mako sharks and our blue sharks and our thresher sharks. Uh, but we actually just had a poor beagle shark wash up on our beach today. Uh, and this is a species we don't really see very often in this area, usually much further north. It's a colder water, deeper water shark. And a poor beagle uh, is a cousin to the great white shark, the white shark. Uh, so we do see sand tiger sharks sometimes a little closer to shore here and in Long Island, uh, a Long Island Sound. Uh, and sandbar sharks historically have been found there too. But a lot of people don't realize we get hammerhead sharks that come through Rhode Island waters in late season. They see tiger sharks come through Rhode Island waters in late season, very rarely seen, but they do. And these are species that people just think are down south. We don't have to worry about these things. And you don't have to worry about them. But this is the reality that there's a whole world out there that you don't get to see until you get in it. And something you do find on the beaches a lot here, and people often pick up and say, what is this, are um, egg cases. Yes. And I know you have an initiative uh, that you're starting or, or have just started, uh, the Rhode Island Egg Case Survey? Yes, that's survey. Right. Can you tell us a little about that and, and what egg cases are for, I mean, I'm sure everybody's picked one of these up on a beach, um, but... What, what is an egg case and, and what is this survey and, and this project all about? Sure. So a lot of folks have probably picked up an egg case or two over the time and thought it was seaweed or bladder rack, something they can pop and make a fun noise with. Uh, <laughs> but actually, they originally had a single embryo in them. And uh, the egg cases we find in our region, we actually do find four different species here, but three of them are skates. And we do actually have one shark that lays an egg case here, and it's the chained cat shark. So, but of all elasmobranchs or sharks, skates, and rays, only 30% of them actually lay eggs. The rest of them actually give live birth. So finding eggs is pretty cool because it can help us understand how those species are utilizing the waters. So if I can get citizen scientists to go out there and collect egg cases for me all over the beaches of Rhode Island, it might help me over time, maybe five years, maybe 10 years, see a pattern of movement uh, where these uh, egg cases are being deposited. Additionally, we might find species that are uncommon to our waters creeping in. And just to pivot, um, another project, another realm of Westerly culture that you're working in and you have worked in for a very long time is music. Uh, in fact, when you leave this event, you're going to Perks and Corks across the street to uh, where you've worked for many years um, and hosting putting together, it's a new open mic, is that right? So can you tell me a little bit about your history there as well and, and how, what, what brought that piece, which seems so different than what you're doing with sharks and conservation? Yeah, so we were talking about the recession and uh, you know, before that time period, you know, I was exploring Westerly as a place to kind of set down some creative roots uh, and use it as a kind of a hub for all this all these crazy endeavors I had. And so Perks and Corks at that time was owned by a gentleman named Eric King. And it was in the last year that he owned it. He owned it for the first five years. And I'm not, I'm not sure. It seemed like maybe he didn't really know where to go with it next. He came up with this amazing idea, uh, this boho style, uh, you know, quirk, quirky kind of cafe with a little bit of alcohol in the third year or in the fifth year. Um, and, but he always had music. And it was couches and it was just a cozy living room style kind of venue. And boy, a great place to hang out if you were an artist. And a lot of artists did, uh, myself included. So I, did, I used to do a lot of writing there and do a lot of drawing. Uh, I was doing a, a lot of deep meditating at that time. And so I was uh, definitely connecting with a lot of people. But um it eventually was bought by 
a friend of mine, Brian, who was bartending on Thursday nights and he's since owned it uh, for 20 years <laughs> and it's become, you know, a staple for downtown Westerly. And for all of that time, we've had like six nights of entertainment. Uh, we've been known for, you know, having just uh, amazing music. Uh, this area is just teeming with talent. Uh, I know I've used the word teeming twice. <laughs> but there's just so much here and my involvement, you know, it's just being friends with him, uh, just as a creative consultant, you know, I've, I've played all the roles there. Like I said, I had to make money somewhere when I was in town. Uh, so sometimes I would manage, sometimes I would bartend, sometimes I was just handling the, the media, the marketing, the music booking. Um, sometimes there was a period of time I wasn't here at all. Um, so I, I am back in a creative consulting capacity and I'm helping him, uh, currently, uh, bring music back after the pandemic, uh, eliminated music for so many places in this area. And it's great to see it coming back. Songwriters open mic on Monday nights and Wednesday nights. We do have a songwriter night, uh, that is a gig. So we're finally offering gigs again. <laughs> I like to end all of these conversations kind of the same way um, by asking kind of a, a bigger, deeper question about your place in this community um, and the work that you do in this community and, and what, what kind of lasting legacy you would like that work to have on the community and what you'd like to be known for doing in this community. I know it's a big question. Um, I usually like to prep people with this ahead of time. I did <laughs> not prep you, um, but yeah, I mean, what uh, of this work that you're doing, which is important work, um, you know, what do you what do you hope becomes your legacy or, or something that you do that that sticks and remains and makes some lasting change? All right, well, my answer to that 10 years ago might have been different than it is now. Uh, you know, it, it's not about me. So that's a big piece of this process for me. I, I think if I leave anything behind in this town. Uh, you know, my goal was to create tools, uh, whether it's through marketing and design to help a small business better itself and take it to another level, um, or a museum, you know, that's born out of a few artifacts that became something that is, you know, picked up all around the world right now. Um, uh, whether it's advocacy, you know, for species in need, like our local Mako sharks, which we just got a retention ban for last year. You can no longer catch Mako sharks, um, you know, but the road to getting there was a tumultuous one. And I would love to teach people, you know, how we got there. Uh, so I, I would, I would say I would love to leave some useful tools behind for this area to thrive further. All right. Well, Keith, thank you for joining us. Everybody. Thanks so much. Thanks for tuning in to the United Theatre Podcast Network. If you enjoyed this episode, we encourage you to subscribe to our show so you never miss an episode. And if you could take a moment to leave a review, we greatly appreciate it. Your feedback helps us create